amateur. I could beat the shit out of Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Pussy. <laughs> Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. More on them in just a bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. I, as always, am your host, Simon. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's crack on with it, shall we? What are we talking about? History's most bizarre assassination. S -s -s Plural. And attempts. All right, then. I think I came up with this idea, but I came up with this so long ago. I'm like, all right. <laughs> How bizarre can assassination be? Yeah, I got shot in the head. Okay. <laughs> there were brains everywhere. Oh, God. Hilarious. <laughs> it's baffling how the very first assassination attempt on a sitting US president in 1835 went so spectacularly tits up. The would-be assassin, Richard Lawrence, had two pistols and two clear shots at President Andrew Jackson at point-blank range, but still he somehow managed to make a pig's ear of the whole operation. <laughs> Sounds like... What's that? Uh, poor performance, poor preparation leads to piss-poor performance? It's something I remember my uh, history teacher always used to say to me. And it's like, okay, <laughs> I guess I better memorize those dates then. God, does anyone else, I don't know, for me, GCSE history, there was like at least two A4 pages of memorizing dates, which uh, was really intense. And then I went to, to study law. And then it was like, guess what? You remember that GCSE history? You thought you had to memorize a lot of dates then? Guess what, bitch? <laughs> Just pages, just lists of important cases, or in history's case, just lists of important battles. And you're like, oh my god, why do I have to memorize this? When is there ever going to be a situation where I can't look up the year that Hitler invaded Poland? 1939. The seventh president of the United States believed that God was on his side that day. Secret Service reply, f*** you, mate. <laughs> I do feel about this. I, I know it's an old joke that has been made many times before. But you know when a patient has a life-saving op- Like that dude who had a f***ing pig's heart put in his body and they knocked out some genes or something so it'd accept the pig's heart. He recently died, which was sad. But still, progress was made in the insane science of putting organs from pigs inside people, which is amazing. Um, and is not this guy, but you know, the situation is like, well, we just thank God for the day that he saved our little Becky from the fire and brimstone that would be the hell. And uh, I just imagine the doctors and surgeons being like, bro, you f serious right now? I was in there for 17 hours. You serious? What? F you. I f your Jesus. Hey, excuse me, madam. Russia. Fuck me. How about fuck you? I'm sorry, I meant that Jesus was acting through your hands. And it's like, no, these hands, they, it's, it's years, decades of practice and medical school. And it's America. Let's say it's half a million dollars in debt or something. Uh, so what was it? Lincoln? Lincoln? Not Lincoln. Jackson believed that God was on his side. But equally ridiculous, Richard Lawrence believed that he was Richard III. Oh shit, <laughs> what, like reincarnated. And to be fair, it didn't sound like the house painter had put a lot of planning into the operation. To be fair, no, it just sounds like he should have planned, maybe. What are you doing today? I mean, I assassinate the president. You've done any preparation at all? Have you shot any trees? No, no, nothing. I just realized that the shooting trees reference is an inside joke, but it was a joke I made on a different channel. So sorry about that. I'm not going to explain it. If you get it, bravo. Let me know in the comments. On the d That episode probably hasn't come out yet because that channel's so far recorded ahead. No one's going to get it. I'm so sorry. I'm such a f***ing amateur. On the day of the attempt, he apparently had been sitting idling around in his failing paint shop before suddenly bolting to his feet with the words, I'll be damned if I don't do it. The seventh president of the United States had been attending a congressional funeral for South Carolina Representative Warren Davis in the U.S. Capitol. Richard Lawrence, armed with two Derringer pistols, had originally intended to shoot President Jackson on the way in. But he couldn't quite get close enough. However, as the 67-year-old President Jackson later hobbled his way out of the Capitol with the aid of a cane, Richard was provided with the perfect opportunity. He leapt out from behind a pillar on the east portico, and from a distance of a few feet, he fired his pistol directly at Jackson's back. The gun misfired. Ah, uh, ah, uh, can you imagine that moment? You're like, oh no. <laughs> And they're like 17 Secret Service dudes just start loading you up with lead. I know there weren't Secret Service dudes and there probably weren't like tons of guns. But like they just, I don't know, there's some dudes just jump on you with a bunch of swords and like tear you apart. Not one to concede defeat so easily, Richard still quite amazingly had time to take out the other pistol from his pocket and take another point blank shot at the president. 
presidential protection in the past was a bit of a joke. And even more astoundingly, the second gun also misfired. It's widely reported that at this point, the frail president, who had long suffered for an extensive list of injuries and illnesses, started battering the 34-year-old Richard around with the hickory cane. <laughs> legend. <sighs> it's possible that he did try and have a go, but it's more likely that Richard was wrestled to the ground by cabinet officers and bystanders before Jackson had a chance to really get stuck in. <laughs> It's like the, the pre-version of the Secret Service was just like, nah, 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 just the people in the cabinet. It's just a bunch of old dudes. <laughs> However, Richard Lawrence was ultimately found not guilty of attempting to murder the president. I'm going to guess on the grounds that he's absolutely f***ing mental because he thinks he's Richard III. On the grounds that he was mad as a box of frogs indeed, although Jackson himself was convinced that Richard had been hired in a plot cooked up by his arch rivals in the Whig party, the truth is that English-born Richard had become convinced that he was the 15th century Richard III. <laughs> this... <laughs> That's a good defense, isn't it? Why'd you murder this person? Well, I'm Richard III and it is my entitlement. Get that guy to the f***ing hospital and load him up with those drugs that they used in that movie. The one with the bald dude. He probably wasn't bald. Based on the book. One threw over the cookie's nest. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know who I'm thanking other than my big brain. And this house painter clearly had a but had a brush to grind. Oh, Danny, hilarious. With the US government, whose opposition to reauthorizing the charter of the Second Bank of the United States was allegedly depriving the king of all the vast payments that he should be picking up from the American colonies. He is apps. He's not just like Richard the Third. He's like I'm Richard the Third, and I've thought about it. It's speculated that Richard's long-term exposure to toxic chemicals in the paints that he has been using, he had been using, was a key factor in driving him over the edge. A jury took just five minutes to declare him criminally insane. King Richard the Third spent the rest of his life in a mental institution. <laughs> what if he was Richard the Third? Here's a funny thing, though. Almost exactly a century later, the Smithsonian Institute decided to test Richard's Richard's original Derringer pistols, and they both fired perfectly the first time. I was going to say they tested him and found out that he was Richard the Third. Experts have noted that the dampness of the day may have contributed to Richard's double misfiring, but it's still calculated that the odds of both guns misfiring were one in 125,000. Maybe President Jackson was right when he suggested did divine intervention i remember like i was playing poker and we were i've played a lot of poker in my life not like a crazy man not some degenerate gambler i don't think i've ever I, i'm not really a gambler at all i don't really like gambling we just play poker for like 20 bucks or whatever equivalent in pounds or maybe it was 20 it was not much money but i remember being a student we were all playing poker and a fret someone got two full houses in a f***ing row and we're just like, what the f***ing odds of that? It was absolutely insane. Like, two in a row. Like, the next hand. Same thing. That's really vanishingly unlikely, right? I'm not like, oh, it happens all the time. The, all the poker people are going to be like, oh, Simon, come on. I've seen that at least seven times. Um, I thought that was incredibly unlikely, and I don't think I've ever seen it since. Maybe President Jackson was right when he suggested divine intervention. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No. But when the world is crammed with creative killers continually concocting cutting-edge conspiracies to commit carnage... <laughs> Danny thinks he challenges me with this alliteration, please. I am the master of reading. Bow down before my glorious reading abilities. Ah. <laughs> it's like I have literally built a career on reading sh**. <laughs> it is shit, Austin. Oh good, then it's not just me. The intended target may find that even having God on your team isn't always going to guarantee you a celestial escape pod. Now let me interrupt today's video to tell you about our wonderful sponsors who you've absolutely heard about before. Squarespace are well, they, the longest running, most loyal, and I would just say most wonderful sponsor, Squarespace, who, look, you've heard me talk about this before, you use Squarespace to build, do I even need these anymore? I have these points in front of me and it's like, I know this by heart. I know what I've got to talk about, but look, if you haven't got Squarespace yet and you've been thinking about building a website, you've got some idea, I don't know, you want to start a blog, you want to write down your thoughts on paper and maybe annoy the world and share it with your neighbors, or maybe you're good at something, maybe you're like, I don't know, you like cooking you like sports, something like that, you want to share your opinions with the world, put some useful information out there, make a blog and do it with Squarespace, it's easy. What if you want to sell something, you've got an idea for a business, I don't know, maybe you want to sell like 
something digital, even something physical. You can do it with Squarespace. They uh, allow you to make a store on their uh, on their platform, which is incredibly easy. How does it work with Squarespace? What you do is you just go to squarespace.com, you sign up, it's easy, and then you get into this area and they're like, well, what do you want to do? What do you want to make? And you're like, well, I want to make this side sort of website. So you click there and they're like, well, what sort of style do you like? Here are all these templates and there are loads of them and they all look awesome and you're like, that one, bingo. Then you open it up and then it's like, great, this is now your website. And obviously it's filled with like, I can't remember if it's Laura Ipsen or like oh, placeholder text and images. Replace all of those, customize it, throw in your own name, being like Simon's incredible sports blog, Simon's store of widgets or whatever. You fire it all up, you customize it, and then it's just good to go. If you're more design inclined, as I always say, I am not. I would never attempt to do this, but you can customize it a lot. Whenever I attempt to customize something, I'm like, yeah, let's make it like this. And I have this beautiful image in my mind of how this custom page is going to be, and then I make it and it looks horrible um, which is why I just use templates but if you're design inclined customize it look that's what Squarespace is it's honestly it's just the easiest way to do it why would you why would you build a website any other way I don't know I don't know code I don't know anything there's other ways you can do it but just don't just do it with Squarespace go to squarespace.com slash blaze for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain again squarespace.com slash blaze for 10% off your first purchase and now back to today's video exit mauled by a bear the last thing you see before everything fades to black forever is the face of an angry bear you're in the movie the revenant <laughs> what was that that movie where there was a whole internet rumor going around that in the movie leonardo dicaprio gets raped by a bear right and i saw the movie and i was like he's not getting raped by a bear he's just getting absolutely savaged by a bear and for then some reason he takes a nap inside a dead horse which was like oh dude <laughs> what are you doing and somehow that was the movie it's, it's one of my least favorite dicaprio movies and i'm a fan um and that was the one he won an academy award for Did people not see the great gatsby it was amazing oh speaking of weird movies that i thought were snubbed by the oscars i saw i was a bit worried about seeing the nicholas cage movie pig because i was like on oh, it's one of those ones where it gets a higher critic score than an audience score even though the audience score was still like 84 percent on rotten tomatoes and usually when that happens i'm gonna be honest oh, it's gonna be a bit too it's gonna be a bit too intellectual for my small brain it's gonna be a bit too i don't know artsy fartsy i was i was completely wrong it's an amazing movie it sounds like a pretty gruesome way to go what does? Oh, game mauled by a bear, my bad. And it certainly was, <laughs> in the case of 17th century influential Swiss politician, Jorg Gensnatch, or Genatch. <laughs> but it must also have been a tad embarrassing as his killer was hardly a ferocious grizzly bear. It had more in common with Paddington Bear or Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Amateur, I could beat the shit out of Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Pussy. How dare you? You see, it wasn't a real bear at all. It was a man dressed up in a novelty bear costume, concealing a very real pistol and wielding an equally real axe. Oh my god, that is the stuff of nightmares, my dude. Jorg Gensnatch was a former preacher turned political leader and a big hand in shaping European politics during the Thirty Years' War. This was a period when tensions were rising between Protestants and Catholics, and Jorg appeared to have difficulty in deciding which side he was supposed to be on. Oh my god, I just tried to cover this. I, uh, was it the Thirty Year War? It was some war between Protestants and Catholics. Who gives a f It was back in the day. It's so confusing. And I was like reading this, and one of my writers had put it together, and I'm like, dude, I have no idea what's going on. Can you like lower the reading level on this by about 10 years? And he lowered the reading level. I'm like, I still don't understand. And I could go back and read the text. And, I'll, and he's like, yeah, this is a really complicated subject. And I'm like, can we abandon it, please? <laughs> and so we're not covering that because it's too complicated. And I'm like, you want to learn about that? What's that one where they the, there's that famous uh, thing in history where it's like, if you try and understand, if you think you understand the like battle over these French provinces or something like that, you own it, it's just really you're saying that you don't understand because no one understands unless you've got like a phd in it or something it's uh, i don't know let's move on what am i talking about i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm like page two jesus christ and for a former man of the cloth he wasn't afraid to get his own hands dirty in fact he was a bit of a ruthless and corrupt bastard and he tortured rival priests to death and had once seen off his political arch opponent pompeius von planter by overseeing his bludgeoning to death with an axe in his own castle sounds about right that he gets murdered by winnie the pooh then doesn't it almost 20 <laughs> just imagining xi jinping <laughs> 
Have you guys seen that video? It just, just Googles. I'm sorry. I know we're all over the place today. Just YouTube search. What's up, Beijing? W-A-S-S-U-P. And it's a video of Xi Jinping just saying there. What's up, Beijing? And it's <laughs> apparently in Mandarin it means I'm here in Beijing. <laughs> but it definitely sounds like saying, What's up, Beijing? <laughs> What's up, Beijing? What's up? What the? I got you, homie. <laughs> Giant panda. What's up, Beijing? <laughs> gonna get murdered. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm gonna be on the assassination video someday. Great. I, I'm, I'm thinking about starting a new channel. It's a work in progress. And the first video was three stories about states murdering people. One was about Putin murdering someone. <laughs> One was about Kim Jong-un murdering someone, and one was about, oh, it was, um, oh god, I don't even remember what the third one was, but basically I'm talking about the worst people in the world murdering people, like, and I'm like, oh, I'm definitely gonna be on some murder list now, <laughs> one of these guys, they're gonna get together and kill me. Fortunately, I'm just not that important. So they probably won't. Almost 20 years after this brutal murder, Jorg was enjoying the delights of the carnival in the city of Chur. In 1639, he and his buddies were celebrating an event in a private room in a hostel when a group of strangers approached his table and asked if they could join in the festivities. Maybe Jorg should have been a little wary of this group considering he was one of the most hated figures in the region. Some of his buddies expressed strong reservations about inviting complete strangers to the table. Who's having a meal in a restaurant and just someone comes along? I've been in this situation. Like, you know, where you're just sitting in a pub and someone's like, hey, could I join you? And it's like... No, <laughs> like what are you playing at? This isn't like a social club. It's a f***ing restaurant or a pub. Get the f*** out of here. Fuck off. Out. Get out. And maybe a few alarm bells should have gone off in Jorg's head when he saw that most of the group was wearing masks while the ringleader was dressed up as a bear and wielding a massive axe. I don't know, maybe something would have tweaked his mind. He'd be like, this ain't good news, is it? But Jorg was in a party mood and he couldn't really see a problem. He might have thought differently had he known the true face behind the fur. Although his identity was never officially confirmed and the killer was never caught, it's widely believed that he was the son of the murderous Pompeius von Planter, and the axe he was swinging was the very same axe that Jorg had left embedded in the castle floor after murdering his father two decades earlier. Holy sh Someone can hold a grudge. What did he do to you? Murdered your dad when you were a child. <laughs> Get over it! One version of the story describes how the bear went over to shake Jorg's hand and instead just battered him to death with the axe. A conflicting version describes how the axe was merely a diversionary tactic and the bear actually pulled out the pistol from his padded groin and shot Jorg dead. But whatever the weapon- why is he dre- why is he dressed up as a bear? Do you think this old Jorg dude is gonna remember the son of some guy he murdered? I get a feeling he's been murdering people all the time, allegedly. But whatever the weapon of choice, Jorg Jensnatch was definitely one of the very few people in history to have met his device demise at the paw of a heavily tooled up bear. The later diversionary theory does strike me as being more than a little odd on both sides. It's a bit like warmly inviting a complete stranger who's strapped with explosives into your house and then getting all uppity when he stabs you in the eye with a screwdriver. <laughs> well, in that case, it would make sense because if he stabs you in the eye with a screwdriver, his explosives don't go off. He probably just takes off the explosive vessel and is like, cool. I thought this was a suicide mission. Glad I brought this screwdriver. And then he ambles off. Butchering the Butcher of Prague. Oh, I know this one. This is the uh, uh, Operation Anthropoid, the murder of Heydrich. This is a great one. Plenty of people would have welcomed the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich in 1942. <laughs> Reinhard Heydrich. I mean, look, I, you're breaking new ground here, Simon, when you call a Nazi a bellend. He was like the bellendy bell of all Nazis. The high-ranking SS Nasty was one of the most powerful men in Nazi Germany, a principal architect of the Holocaust, and had been affectionately described by his good chum Adolf Hitler as the man with the iron heart. I, uh, <laughs> I recently moved, I'm moving house, hopefully, at some point, and I realized just a couple of streets over, there's a house where one of the Nazis lived, and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> You just think this is like some horrible nut like during the during the war it wasn't Heydrich. Heydrich lived like outside of Prague. Um and I'm like that's that's dark. And then I'm wondering, I wonder if that affects that house's value. <laughs> Yet yeah, few could have predicted that the assassination plot, hatched over several months by the Czech resistance with help from British intelligence, would have devolved into something resembling a scene from a silent slapstick movie. The only things missing were a couple of custard pies and a pair of trousers falling down. By 1951, Heydrich was stationed in Prague in occupied Czechoslovakia on a mission to strengthen policy. 
and carry out countermeasures against resistance. Strengthen the policy of killing the Jews. Uh, first with bombs and rockets, destroying their homes, and then... During this period, the Butcher of Prague was personally responsible for the execution of hundreds of Czechs and the imprisonments of thousands more. Czechoslovakia's London-based government in exile approved a plot to assassinate the Blonde Beast, which involved at least eight months of planning and preparation, including the intense training of two dozen Czech soldiers by the British Special Operations Executive. Just two of these soldiers were handpicked to lead Operation Anthropoid and carry out the assassination in Prague. Joseph Gabčík and Jan Kubisch. God knows what the other 22 candidates were like, as Gabčík and Kubisch might as well have been given the code names Bodger and Scarpa. After parachuting into the Protectorate in late 1941, the duo lived in hiding for five months until promising opportunity presented itself. One morning in May 1942, Heydrich was getting chauffeured to his headquarters at Prague Castle by an SS officer, Johannes Klein. Cocky Heydrich always liked to be driven around with an open roof to show off that he was confident and hard and impervious to bullets. <laughs> Did he learn nothing from the Kennedy assassination? Ah. <laughs> I know. A car journey involved traveling through a section of the Dresden Prague Road where motorists needed to slow down to negotiate a hairpin bend. And it was here the Gabchik and Gubish parked up their bicycles near a tram stop and laid in wait with a stem machine gun. I'm not sure why it took eight months of planning, it's just the sort of thing that would have spontaneously popped up into house painter Richard Lawrence's head over a ham and cheese sandwich after <laughs> As Heydrich's car finally bobbed into view over the quiet country road, Gabchik leapt in front of the vehicle with a stem machine gun and opened fire. Or at least he tried his best. The gun jammed. And although this could just be spoiled speculation, it's believed that the reason the gun jammed was it was clogged up with rabbit food. Really? I've never heard this. To help alleviate the food shortages, the Czechs often bred rabbits, and they were prone to collecting bits of foliage wherever they could and to stuffing it into their pockets to feed bunnies later on. In this case, Gabchik may well have shoved the initially disassembled stern machine gun into his coat pocket that was overflowing with food intended for Thumper. Really? At this point, Heydrich could have counted his blessings and instructed driver Klein to put his foot down, but he was keen to show off that he wasn't scared of a couple of bunny men. Uh-oh, Heydrich, that's not going to work out well for you. He ordered the driver to stop and pull out his own pistol. That's a little gay. Hold on. He ordered the driver to stop and pull out his own pistol to have a go at his would-be assassins. But now was the turn of the other guy, Kubish, to shine. The assassins had another weapon up their sleeves, an anti-tank mine. Kubish lobbed the anti-tank mine directly at the car, and that should have really been the end of the Butcher of Prague. Whilst the mine ripped through the fender and showered Heydrich with metal fragments, Kubish himself would also be wounded by shrapnel. Then Kubish decided to make his escape on bicycle. Driver Klein attempted to shoot him, but was still dazed by the blast and clumsily pressed the magazine catch on his gun, causing it to jam. <laughs> Oh my god. And allowing Kubish to make a getaway from the frankly embarrassing scene. <laughs> that just left Gabchik, who suddenly remembered that he had a pistol in his other pocket. Hopefully, this one wasn't clogged up with rabbit food. But rather than try and finish off Heydrich, who has now collapsed the floor in pain from the blast, he decided to leg it and seek sanctuary in the local butchers. Driver Klein was in hot pursuit on foot, following Croat instructions from his superior to get that bastard. The butcher turned out to be a Nazi Thimper sympathizer who ran out of his shop and directed Klein's attention towards the location of his prey. Oh my god. <laughs> Fuck you, man. These pesky butchers have a reputation for sticking together. It was Gabchik who managed to shoot driver Klein twice in the l Oh, I see. Butcher, butcher, butcher of Prague and a regular butcher. Hilarious. But it was Gabchik who managed to shoot driver Klein twice in the leg before a strangely pedestrian escape on a tram. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> Yet although Gabchik and Kubish were under the impression that they had failed miserably in their comical attempt to kill Heydrich, the mission turned out to be a surprising success. Not that they had that much time to celebrate or be celebrated. In retaliation, the Nazis killed at least 5,000 Czechs to avenge the death of Heydrich, and both Gabchik and Kubish were eventually tracked down. Yeah, they just did it. They just wiped out an entire village, basically. Um, and again the Nazis. Kubisch died in hospital after a prolonged battle with German soldiers, while Gabchik committed suicide before the Nazis could take him alive. They were, both, they were both buried in an unmarked grave. If you haven't seen Operation Anthropoid, it tells the story of this, and it's super intense. And I feel, I don't know, Danny's being a bit harsh on these guys. They parachuted in, they did this whole operation, and they f***ing succeeded. I don't know, maybe I just feel a bit more positive about it because I live here. But I'm like, no, these guys were awesome. And they f***ing murdered Heydrich. And I would say, great, even better, because he suffered in hospital for days 
and then died. And f you, Hydric. Had Reinhardt Heydrich received medical treatment in time, he would almost certainly have survived the blast from the sloppily thrown anti-tank mine, but he actually died from sepsis a few days later. His wounds had become infected by strands of hair that accumulated on the upholstery of his super cool open top car. If the two assassins didn't have divine intervention on their side that day, then my name is definitely not King Richard III. <laughs> So, this has been an episode of uh, Brain Blaze. Thank you so much for watching. Assassinations, huh? What a cheery topic. I was in Beijing.